This man was blind, but he wasn't deaf. Like, if somebody was hawking up a loogie, like, it's something <laughs> like, you know what that is. So that man had to choose to stay there because it was better to go through something messy and potentially get his healing than to stay in the condition he was in. And so um, I did the example. The crazy thing is this was my third time doing this example. This I've done it. I had done it two times prior and at another prominent church. Wow. There was nothing that ever happened because of it. So I called my brother up on the stage. Now, this is my blood brother. This, I mean, we've uh, uh, done everything together. I have four brothers, five Todd boys. I mean, drink after each other, fight, like blood everywhere. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is my real brother. And I think it was a combination of it being COVID season as well as uh, just it being disgusting, which was the point of the example um, that I did it and I put it on his eyes and it's like nasty and all the other stuff. And what ended up happening was that's when I learned that our platform had grown beyond people who were actually invested in life transformation. Mm -hmm. There were people that were watching and that were devouring the content that were there on the fringes to find something to be able to discredit the message. Mm -hmm. And before we even got out of church, I mean, TMZ, CNN, all this, how could you do this to another black man? And Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast, and I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, that way you'll never miss a thing. So pastors, I know how difficult it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, especially when you're preaching week after week. So whether you're hitting a writer's block or you're in a rush because it's Friday and you're trying to put the finishing touches on your sermon, things don't always go as planned. So to help you, I've created a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified the whole process of preparation into a series of steps and reminders that can help me and you ensure that our sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So just go to preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description. You'll get a copy sent to you for free today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Words are powerful, but as a communicator, it's far too easy to underestimate the impact of experiences. So when people experience God in a way that is outside their usual rhythms and routines, lives change. That's why I encourage you to bring a Compassion experience to your church. It's an interactive way to witness the realities of life for children in poverty and the church's incredible response. Families in your community will see how the gospel is transforming lives around the world. And because not everybody can go on a mission trip, you can bring the experience to you. Compassion is currently working with the local church to release over 2.2 million children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I have personally supported them for years. To learn more, go to compassion.com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Mike, welcome back. It's so good to hang out again. What's going on, Kerry? This is, I, I mean, honestly, one of my favorite podcasts to do ever because we go everywhere and uh, you're such a good, not just interviewer, you have so much insight. And so I'm excited. Whatever we're talking about today, let's go. Let's go there. Well, you kind of went there too. And so we're going to talk about that. But I want to start with your physical health. So I've been on a little bit of a journey for the last 18 months. You have been on a journey, I guess, since 2019. Is that it? Or, yes, sir. Wow. So tell us about that because there's been a real transformation there. So um, first thing that I really realized in my life is that um, I've always been raised around people who did great things spiritually, mm -hmm. but sometimes physically it wasn't, um, it didn't match. It, it like they, they didn't have the lifestyle that matched the gifting. And yep. um, one day in prayer, I just feel like, I was I was praying and I got this strong impression that God could only bless our ministry to the level my body could take it. Mm. And I was like that's not fair. Like I, I maybe my intellect or maybe something <laughs> yeah, else yeah. It's like no. Your heart. I only can uh -huh. bless the ministry to the level your body could take it. And honestly, if I'm just being hot, humble, open and transparent, I kind of ignored it. Like it was like I'm young. I'm I mean I'm not in shape, but I'm not like obese. Like, you know, like I just yeah. trying to just, and I mean, probably five years later, 
it was like, there is something wrong with you. Like, mm-hmm. you cannot control your cookies and cream craving. You cannot <laughs> control. Like, mm-hmm. I would find myself one o'clock in the morning out at Wendy's, like getting double bacon cheeseburgers and and all this other stuff. And it really came down to being a disciple, mm-hmm. which that word means discipline one. And I just, I feel like I'm called to represent God to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. And that's not just on a platform that's in my everyday life. And there were certain people that I could tell, especially in the athletic community and different things that couldn't hear my message because they saw me. Oh, wow. They, 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 they know what it is to be disciplined and work out and, and, and make decisions that they don't see the benefit of today, but they will see the benefit of tomorrow. Like they knew that. And I was trying to tell them about their spirit and their heart and, and, and the relationships. And they was like, yeah, we can't hear you. And it was a conglomerate of what I knew God said, the message being impacted and my own emotional eating that was like, I got to do something. And so I started on a journey and um, I started working out four days a week and I started out with five pound dumbbells. Like, and I have pictures and videos of it. I could not do one push up, and everybody's like, oh, this, you lying. I, no, I, my upper body strength was nothing. I couldn't do barely anything, but I did it. Mm-hmm. And I say that to say that I really believe in the uh, the progression, not perfection motto. Like, I believe that God blesses the small step you take as opposed to this giant thing that you do. And I went on a journey and um, it was, it has been long and it has been weird. I thought it was going to happen like that. Oh, yeah. But it, it, it is, it has been the most life transforming journey of my life. I started this process at, at 270 pounds. And now I'm 225, 15.5% body fat. Like it is wild. Mm. I look at myself and I'm like, who are you? Like, but it it's what that Hebrew scripture says that no discipline is enjoyable at the time. Like nobody yeah. likes it. But the fruit of it, everybody loves. And 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 that's where um I just made a commitment to progression, not perfection. And now it's infected my whole family, my wife, my friends, my family. We work out together. My whole garage, my cars do not get parked in the garage. We have started a gym, stride, uh, uh, wellness and transformation garage. Like I, I'm, it, it has become a life source for me. And I tell people all the time, there's like, do you love it? I was like, I do now. But every mm-hmm. discipline starts out with a decision and a decision becomes a discipline a discipline at some point will turn into a desire and then a desire will eventually change your destiny. Mm. Like, like now that I desire it, it has changed the trajectory of my life. Like one day I might open a gym. If this pastoring thing don't work out, (laughs) I'm going to be, I'm going to be pastoring somebody at stride gym. Like that is, it is a part of me. And so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm grateful for what God is doing right before we got on here. I finished my protein shake and I'm oh, yeah. planning my next meal. And like, I had a you protein know, bar right before things. I did this interview. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Let's Mike. go. So I want to break that down a little bit more because I think that's something you and I have in common. I would say I'm an emotional eater. I would also say good for you. You're in your early mid thirties. I waited until I was in my forties to even think about health. And like you, I would sit at these conferences, see these fit guys say, your leadership is, you know, connected to your body. And I'm like, no, it's not. I'm smart. (laughs) And I I resisted that. And I see it now. And, you know, the good news about being in your fifties is you can't get away with cheating anymore. Like your body, you pay, (laughs) dude, you pay. So- and, and I'm like you, I did not enjoy it. I really mm. only recently, I've been, um, you know, I've had fits and starts and I've been cycling. I also learned quite painfully, you can't out-exercise a bad diet. I tried, it yes, doesn't sir. work. Um, it doesn't work. Let's go into, because I think you're right. Um, if I can just say it out loud, you know, being out of shape and even obesity is a problem in ministry in some circles. Where oh, it, it's, it, it is not just a problem, it's, a, it's an epidemic. Like, it doesn't matter what people even look like. Like, health is not what you look like. Health is what you can actually do when God calls you to do it. There you go. And there are many people that when it's time, if God was to do what you were praying for, you would would give out before you finish the purpose. Oh, okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, 
if God really called you to go to all of those countries, and if God really blessed you to be able to have that demanding of a schedule to do whatever the business is, if he really did it because of our health, our habits, those things, we would not be able to reach purpose because we did not train for it. We did not study for it. We did not be disciplined enough for it. And so I, I, I do agree with you a thousand percent. And this is not in any shaming way. Cause it was me. Like I was that guy. Like I, if we, if we, something good happened in my life, we ate. If somebody yeah. died, we ate. If somebody uh, got a raise, we ate. If it was somebody's birthday, we ate. If mm -hmm. I was feeling bad, we ate. Like it was, it, it's like what we did. No, I've, and, oh, I've thought about that, go. Mike, because you know what? Like it's never, we never celebrate with broccoli and boiled chicken, <laughs> right? Ever. <laughs> Never. It's always the ice cream, the fatty foods, cake. the carbs, the cake, Come the on, you man, name pasta. it, man, pasta, like all Let's that go. stuff, which I love. Like there better be I some of that in heaven. Like, honest. oh, Lord, mm -hmm. I want anointed pasta, <laughs> Alfredo. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute, because I said to my trainer, hey, what you need to realize is and I've dropped 20 pounds. You've dropped 50. Congratulations, go, dude. Baby. Congratulations. Yes, sir. But I said my life is a party everywhere I go. And this is true for most part, most pastors, most leaders. You're at a dinner with someone that you're, you know, having a relationship, you know, not a relationship with, but you know what I mean? If you and I yeah, went out, yeah. we're going for dinner yep. And, yep. or you're having lunch or you're doing yep. some staff function or you're at a reception yep. or a party or a wedding or a funeral or a, you name it. And everywhere I go, it's like, nobody takes you to like the salad place. They take you to the steakhouse. <laughs> they take you to their favorite Italian restaurant. Right. Yep. But I realize all those choices lie within me now and I have to be careful <laughs> Let's go here. Where did the eating come from? What was that compensating for? Yeah, so the truth of the matter is one of my key mechanisms when I talk about the damage that's happened in my life um, is when something bad happens to me, I want control. And so control begins to be my barometer of um, how I feel safe. Like nobody else is going to look out for me like I look out for me. And so being in control makes me feel good. You understand what I'm saying? And so when you start adulting and lifing, like you find out there are so many things you're not in control of. <laughs> you're <laughs> like, like, I mean, it like hit, hit me like a ton of bricks in my mid to late twenties. It was like, yeah, you can't control none of that. Like that has nothing to do with you. Even being a pastor of church, people coming, people leaving, you can't control those things. And even when you think you can, you, you wear yourself out and you move towards burnout and bad decisions because you're control you're trying to uh, subliminally have false control over something that you cannot control. Like you can't make people give, you can't make people uh, do, you know what I'm saying? All of those different things. And so when my life is expanding and I'm finding out all these things I can't control, the one thing I can't control is eating. Like I could control mm -hmm. what I have for dinner. I could control like if I order a double cheeseburger or if I order a triple cheeseburger, I can control that. And there was a sense of fulfillment and endorphins and all of the different things, the rush from, mm. oh, a good meal and oh, yeah. all this other stuff and leftovers. And, I mean, it was just, and again, you don't walk into it knowingly, but it was emotional eating. It was pain numbing. It was temporary pacifying what really needed to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. That maybe something that needed to be looked at deeper, but it was just what I could control. And 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 you find out, even when you're married, you can't control your wife. You can't control your kids. Nope. You have them, but you can't control them. <laughs> like, you know, it's all of those different things. And But what can I control? I'm going to have a good meal tonight. What mm -hmm. can I control? Oh, I'm going to eat. Oh, what can I control? Like, and so you get in those things. And then nobody told me as a pastor, it is an ambush. Like, because like you said, breakfast with an elder and then yeah. all of these things. So I literally, I cut out, I don't do any meetings at restaurants no more. None. Oh, that's a great idea. None. But we don't, I literally, it's funny, like people when they have meetings with me, like I meet with them in my gym or I meet with them, we go walking. Like, and like, I, like I, I'm outside, I can't be in the place because if I'm there, I'm You're going, going to start snacking uh -huh. on something. You bring out that spinach dip. I'm going to eat it. Do you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like you bring out them buffalo wings. I'm dipping them in some ranch. But 
if, if I'm not in that environment and it's completely changed the productivity, the efficiency, as well as the intention of the meeting. Cause I was wasting a lot of time because I'm sitting there talking, but what we had to talk about was only 15 minutes worth of content, but because we got to have an appetizer and then we're waiting on them to cook the food. And then I spent an hour and a half at somewhere I could have had a 15 minute conversation with. And so when you start thinking about energy and efficiency and all of those different things, I just cut out restaurants altogether. I haven't been to a restaurant to meet with nobody in probably two years. And it, it has increased my productivity and, and changed the trajectory mm. of the relationships. And so it came from a sense of control, but it really was stemmed in a root of damage that I needed to deal with. And it just all came up. And uh, it's so cool to be on the other side of it, knowing that I have keys to help other people. And it might be my next book, Carrie. I might, I might really try to help people with the journey, but I wanted to make sure I walked it out and maintained it for a few years before I started writing about it. You know, I had not thought about just not meeting at restaurants, but what a great idea. Um, talk about the difference it makes. So I'll give you a very micro example. I've lost yeah. 20 pounds. I have a calorie cap every day. I have to have a certain number of grams of protein, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. And anybody who's been yes, through sir. this knows the drill. And But I was sort of cheating in the sense that I didn't go over my calories, but I was having little carby snacks, you know, yeah, some yeah. chips here. And that was allowed. But I wasn't yeah. feeling great and my joints hurt a little bit too much and I was kind of sluggish. So I was talking to my trainer on the weekend and he just said, yeah, don't snack anymore. And just talking to another guy, he's like, just have more protein. So I've eat, done eat. that, dude, three <laughs> days. I'm like, I'm like the Energizer bunny. It's like amazing. Yes, what are the, and that's a micro thing to talk about yeah. this journey. And I am, listen, for those of you listening, there's no judgment I am the worst convert, the most reluctant convert, and I'm sort of enjoying it now too, okay? But yep. I just realized this is essential. Do I want to live my next 20 years as a slug on, man. or do I want to be active? And do you notice a brain-body connection? Like what are some oh. of the benefits that you've seen to your man, leadership? Man, the first thing is you're speaking before you open your mouth. Like, I want everybody to realize, like, this transformation in my body for my team and staff, like, there are more people working out, cycling, doing things. And I've never said, we're going to be a staff that's in shape. But as it is in the head, like, it, it starts to flow. I have preached more, given more leadership, leadership talks on fitness and lifestyle with never opening my mouth. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is it increases your leadership because people, if you're disciplined in one area, especially in one that's usually hard for people, like it, it makes people be like, all right, well, I may not agree with all the methods and da, 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 but there's something in that leader that I can follow. Mm -hmm. And so it is very hard to follow a leader that does not lead themselves. And, and, and that is a principle that I'm really starting to learn the ripple effect of how far it goes when you start leading yourself and people equate it to other things in your leadership. And so that's the first thing. It has multiplied my leadership. Hmm. Number two thing is I feel great. Yeah. Like, and when I say I feel great, um, when the Bible talks about being strong and courageous, I think there are certain things that we can do to feel like that. Like, when I do something hard in the morning, like it's the hardest thing I do all day. So if I have to go into the office and deal with a hard situation or I have to uh, uh, talk about transitioning somebody or somebody left or da, 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 I'm OK because I already did something hard today. Like I've already been strong and courageous. Like I already have gotten the, the blood flowing through my body and pushed through a hard situation and encouraged myself and been encouraged by other people. It literally gives you confidence mm -hmm. to go into whatever you're doing and be strong and courageous. And so I've seen it just, I was already confident before. Like mm -hmm. I was already, like I was going into the room uh, 250 plus still like, what's up, baby? <laughs> like, but this has changed and it's not like a, it's like what I need to be, um, to face all the things that we face as leaders, like to be able to, to keep showing up. It, it just changes your perspective as you go into something. And the third thing that I'll say for me is it's created a new sense of community around something that's improving all of the people around us. 
So like, if you would have came to my house three years ago, there would have been food and different things in my house that were um, pretty much encouraging people to go down the wrong path. Yeah. And I'm not saying that none of those uh -huh. foods are here now because I have four kids and I got a wife that does enjoy cake every once in a while and all those different things. But along with that, now there are choices and things that our community has come around. Like literally, I just finished working out with seven people that that literally I work with, that are around, that help take care of our kids. and like, But like, it's a community. And I just think that sometimes... Um, People who lead large organizations or small businesses, they don't do anything outside of their work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's healthy to have another community that's not attached to a success metric that is outside of you, but really it's you against you, but you have a community of people doing that with you. It is just so many days when I felt like, ah, oh, I don't want to do nothing. I get in there for an hour with that group of people and it's that energy and, and the strength and like the fact that we all made it. And I'm not talking about like working out with big muscle bound guys. I'm talking about like four foot six, like little white girls, <laughs> like are part yeah. of like my workout crew. But it's like, if we all can do this together, like we can all go do whatever God's called us to do. And so, I mean, I could give you stuff. I am a different person, Carrie Newolf. Like I am not the same person because I've embraced discipline. And it's crazy to say discipline becomes freedom. Like, yes, there are things that I can do now that I don't even have to think about, like taking my kids up the stairs because they fell asleep on the couch used to be like, oh, my God, <laughs> like, just let them sleep on the couch. Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Now, pick them up, hit up 20 stairs. And it's like, wow, I can do this. Like, it's just so many daily functional things that it's increased my faith. Like, mm -hmm. really, I... I can I tell you the biggest thing it did for yeah. me? And I, I didn't know we were going to spend, spend this much time talking about this, but this is why I love talking to you because we're going to go everywhere. Like, um, this has made me believe me. Mm. It has increased my faith in my own word. Wow. And many times we proje project that, that we are dependable and 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 we're people of our word, but we know how many times we break our word to ourselves. We know how many times we say we're going to call somebody and we don't call them. We know how many times we say we're not going to eat the cake, but we have just one mm -hmm. bite. And and this has literally made me believe me, like believe that I will do what I say, that the excuses that used to make me go backwards they no longer have the same grip over my life. And what that does is it, it is it makes me like what the word says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. My yes has kind of been maybe in the past. And my no has kind of be like, ah, if it works out. Like it hasn't been yes, yes, no, no. In this season, this, this discipline journey, um, it has made my yes, yes, and my no, no. Mm. And I trust me so then others can trust me more. And um, it's changed me. It's transformed me is really what it's done. Weird question. I've never made this association until you just said what you said. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question. Maybe it goes nowhere. Do you feel less overwhelmed? Oh, completely. Yeah. It, it, it's because th this, is, this is the thing. My workload and my responsibility and the, the, the perception and the criticism and everything's just increased. Yeah. I'm just stronger. Okay, there like, you go. Like, like, mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, Not just physically stronger, yeah. but when you're doing things that are hard to do, like there is not one day I wake up and go to the gym and be like, oh yes, this is going to be easy. Like <laughs> not one day. But the mental exercise of doing something you don't want to do over and over, it's training something in you. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it makes you stronger. So meetings I don't want to go to, it's easier for me to go to now because I've already done things I haven't wanted to do and done them well over and over and over and over again. So this meeting ain't going to take me out because them 50 burpees didn't take me out. Like, yeah. I, like do you understand what I'm saying? And so it's, it's really like I do feel less overwhelmed mm -hmm. because I have greater capacity now. No, like, go ahead. No, 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 you go. Like, I just think that I have more capacity to be able to handle what comes at me and what comes with the responsibility of what God's trusted me with. Cause I've done it in a practical way, six days a week. 
So I, I promise listeners, this is not the workout show. Uh, we will move <laughs> on to other things, but I think this is really good because I love talking to you about it because it's so recent. It's not natural. It's not like you were an all-star college athlete. Now look it's, at me in my thirties, no. you know, da, 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 da. And no. you, you know this with every decade, the cheating, the cheating gets more and more Ooh. expensive, you know? Ooh. And yes, sir. a couple of thoughts. And then I've got another question on fitness for you, but you know, mid fifties, I'm noticing mm. almost all of my friends and family at my age have to sit down to tie up their shoes. And I was yes, noticing sir. I had to start sitting down and tying up my shoes. And I said to my wife, Tony, I'm like, I don't have to sit down and tie up my shoes. Like I used mm. to be able to do this, no problem. So I got into this ditch your dad bod thing. And, you know, now I can tie up my shoes, not quite standing on my head, but at least, you come know, on, somewhat. Come on. Upside down, handstand, <laughs> tie up your shoes, carry new off. So four, four days a week, same for me. So I have three off, four on for workouts. And in At Your Best, my last book, I wrote that I don't exercise during my green zone in the morning because that's when all my productivity happens. About six months into the program, I flipped my workouts from afternoon to morning. And at first I was really nervous about it. But doing that for about a year now, first of all, if we issue a second edition, I will correct it or at least explain myself. Exactly what you said, that for, first of all, by four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm in my red zone and I'm like, yeah, I'm not yeah. doing it or you phone it in or whatever, <laughs> right? Too many excuses. And then I'm worrying that I'm burning jet fuel by doing it first thing in the morning. And I am definitely starting later, but I'll do my workout sometime between six and 7.30, depending on the yes, day sir. and my schedule. And what I found is it actually builds me for the rest of the day. Yes. Is there something to timing for you as well? I mean, I think that number one, everybody's different. Yeah. So yeah. I think that some people get energized by it being the last thing they do and they're going to get a good sleep that night and all that other stuff. But for me, um, I found that if it's the first thing that I do, if it's if it happens in the morning, I get fueled up for the day. Like literally to the point to where Sunday, because of me being a pastor and a preacher and all the different things that I do, is usually my most draining day because it is spiritual, it is emotional, it is relational, it is it is all the things. And so how I feel usually Sunday by three o'clock, four o'clock, I'm like wiped. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking like, what, ha what would happen if I work out on Sunday morning? And the wow. mere thought of it was like, no. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need an, I need another hour and a half of sleep. No, not happening. About a year ago, I started waking up at six o'clock in the morning on Sundays. Trainer meet me in the garage, and we lift and weights for an hour and a half. Carrie, when I tell you that by the time I get on stage to preach, I am so alive. Like I am so. I have already physically lifted so heavy on that day. Like we intentionally go heavy on Sundays and it's a mental mind connection for me because it's like spiritually, I, I, I want to lift and help the Lord lift people out of, out of, out of despair into hope. I want to lift. And so I get people in my mind, I'm praying, I got worship music going, but I'm like literally lifting heavy and I'm praying that God would lift the heavy load off of families and businesses. And it's like, th this is what I do. But like by the time I get to church, I feel like I can run through a wall. Like mm. I feel like, and and I never thought in a million years I would be able to do it. But I haven't taken a Sunday nap in almost a year. Wow. Like, like when I started working out in the morning, the, I'm still tired, but it's like, it doesn't make sense to go to sleep now. Before I had to, like mm. by three or oh, yeah, four o'clock, football is on and I'm dead. Like mm -hmm. I'm out of here. But literally I haven't taken a Sunday nap in almost a year. Wow. Because- it just feels like something is moving. My day is consistent. I'm being disciplined. And then just for me as a person of faith, I'm taking care of my temple. Mm -hmm. This thing is something that the Holy Spirit is supposed to be using. Why would I give him a broke down hoopty Volkswagen when I could give him a Tesla? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Or a souped up truck. And I just think that for me, um, many of us are asking God to do way more than he has to if our vehicle was taken care of and maintained. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. And you know what? I resisted that part of the message too. I would read, you know, your body is a temple of the Lord. And I'm like, well, not much of a temple, you know, but <laughs> you know, you're right. There is a connection. So 
you got people cheering you on going, yes, preach. And then you got people going, ugh. Like what, yeah. what would you say to the person who like you or me was very slow to get started in this space? I want to let you know that um, my favorite scripture says that God will give you both the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Like I use this in every aspect. This was the scripture that helped me start. He will give me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I wanted the desire, but like I said earlier, the desire comes from the discipline and the discipline comes from a decision. I would just encourage you to start something consistently. If it literally is a 35-minute or a 45-minute walk around your neighborhood while you watch Netflix, do that four days a week. If you can stay consistent with doing that four days a week, watching TV, literally just walk and watch TV. Like, all I'm asking you to do is watch and walk TV. And that is easy because your mind's not thinking I'm working out. Mm -hmm. Like, just walk and watch TV or walk and listen to a podcast and walk. If you do that consistently for two or three months, you're going to see that you're going to, without anybody saying anything, you're going to naturally want to take it up. You're going to naturally be like, well, if I'm out here walking, I might as well jog at least two minutes of it. Like, and this, you're going to start to see, and one person is going to be like, man, you looking good. It's like, well, I am uh, walking every day. <laughs> like, and, and, and that energy is going to continue to encourage you. And so I just tell people to start, like start with something you can win at. Yes. Don't start with some actual huge lofty, like, I want to be able to bench press. No, mm -hmm. I was doing five pounds. Like, I have video proof of it. I was a grown man with four kids starting with five pound weights. I felt yeah. so not manly. I felt so and like, what? please. Like, are you, you, we're about the same size. Are you 6'2 or yeah, something? Yeah, I'm like 6'1, 6'1, 6'1 six one. Six one. Six yeah. one and a half. Yeah. 270 pounds. And I'm sitting up there with like five pounds. Like, these are milk cartons, but like, it's where I had to start. And if you can start with somewhere you can win, it will give you the wind that you need to continue to go. And um, that's what I would encourage somebody. Find a win, a consistent win. Stay consistent at that, and it's going to propel you forward. Progression, not perfection. You know our mutual friend, Craig Rochelle. You know Craig. and uh, He's a bodybuilder. Nobody cares okay. about Craig Rochelle. He's already <laughs> freaking Mr. Olympia. Like, nobody... No, I'm just... Playing. No, I know, I know. And he'd laugh if, if you told him that. But, you know, the thing about Craig that nobody would suspect unless you know him, and he's he's been open about this, is he's not disciplined by nature. The reason he is so disciplined is because he's not disciplined. And people think I'm yeah. disciplined off the chart. I'm exceptionally undisciplined. And did you find a similar dynamic? It's like, I'm, I'm not disciplined. I need this. Like, Yeah, no, this is the exact reason I believe that God was like, hey, uh, can't bless you anymore until you get this under, under control. Yeah. I, I think it was an opportunity. Where we fail, where we have hardship, I believe it's an opportunity for us to become great. And if we were already naturally great at it or we were naturally um, um, an expert or could excel at it, yeah. it would not be a place for God's power and our decision to meet and it becomes something beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so like, I would have never thought for me it would be working out or anything like that. But like now for me, it's like people, all oh, my wife would be like, my, I have a gym owner husband and he's a trainer. <laughs> and like, and I'll hear her say that stuff and, I have people come up to me in the airport and it's like, hey, do you do you play for uh the Jaguars? I was like, no, like I don't play <laughs> football. Like, but they think because of that, and it has literally been because I made a decision that turned into a discipline, that discipline turned into a desire, and that desire is now helping me reach destiny. And I'm really, really grateful for this journey I've been on. I'll look forward to the next time, or perhaps that would be the first time that somebody asked me if I'm a professional athlete. So it's uh, happening. That'll be great, dude. It's happening. That'll be great. All right. Catch us up. Let's talk about your church. Last time we yeah. talked, we were in the middle of COVID. It was a couple of years ago. You decided to stay closed for a little bit longer yeah. than you yeah. legally had to. Talk about that decision and what's happened since, Mike. So part of the reason this, I'm going to clear this up because a lot of people think that we decided to stay closed. What ended up happening for real is that our construction started on the inside of the building during COVID. Right. And because of um, the supply chain not being able to get things here, we were not able to complete construction to get occupancy back into the building. And so we had to stay closed until the stuff was finished 
So, because, you know, our biggest priority is that people be safe and that their children have places to be able to do whatever they need to do. And so um, what we thought was going to be just a little longer turned into a lot longer. And um, yeah, we were closed almost two and a half years. Like we were like, it was like shut down. We were online. But the crazy thing about it is the online exploded. It was ridiculous. It was, it was people getting transformed, set free all over the world. And it was, um, it was learning. It was innovation. It was figuring out things differently. It was trying to figure out what mattered to us and our team and what was God saying. And I feel like we got to go on this really cool innovation journey that most churches as well as, uh, most people would never have to or have the opportunity to to do. And I think feel like it taught us a lot as well as I feel like God was breathing on it to show us a little glimpse of the future, of what it could actually look like to be in people's lives and the stories be real and the baptisms be real and the the being filled with the spirit being real. And it's not happening like in a building. Like mm-hmm. I was preaching to my staff basically for two years, like, and it was going all over the world. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it has been weird that we've only been open, like at the time of this podcast, we've almost been open a year again. Like that's yeah. it. like, so like 2020 happened. And I think it was last October, September that we, uh, opened back up. And so it's building the church again, it's building, it's, you know, in that time period, um, people, especially needing connection, a lot of people, transition churches they found community places and we encouraged that we was like yo we we can't meet but the church is alive like Mm. and so we're a kingdom church so we sent people to to churches and gave them permission and just let them know like go to victory go to battle creek go like i want you to be fed Uh, we didn't pick this situation but we in it so we got a steward over it and so um it's been fun to watch the body of christ in our city grow like and and people connect that probably would never have been connected and now we're at the fun intersection of uh building and rebuilding um our ground location um into what this iteration's supposed to look like in this next season and so it has been it has been fun it's been challenging it's been exciting but I know we're right in the middle of what God wanted to do when our vision is to represent him to lost people and found people for transformation in Christ and so this is this has been a, a a fun time around these parts. Yeah, that would be such an interesting thing because every other church would have been open for about, you know, a, a year, year and a half, half of yeah. those two years you were closed. And yeah, definitely. Two and a half years you were closed. So, I mean, I can see they're itching to get back in person and you just kind of blessed them and said, hey, if you, you fed other churches while you were online only. Yeah. Definitely. What like, what made you I, make this, that decision? Because I imagine it was mixed emotions. Not for me. Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe for some people on my staff, maybe for all the different things, because mm. church culture was not my culture. Kingdom culture was. And I, I've always, I mean, from the very beginning of me being a pastor, like we have these little cards at our church. I know I'm a, sp- uh, a specific flavor of of communicating. I'm going to be funny, I'm going to be loud, I'm going to use examples, I'm going to I'm going to be myself. And so I understand that I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And so we literally made not your cup of tea cards and it has 15 other churches on it. And and literally they're at the front. Hey, we know we may not be your cup of tea, but here are some other life-giving churches that are in our area and we would love for you to check them out. This is not about transformation church. This is about the kingdom of God being expanded and people actually growing. And so from the time I became a pastor, I've always done this. Like I've always been about promoting and platforming and 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 giving the capital C church a better name than just our church name. Every year we literally have two Sundays that we close our doors on Sunday and tell people to go to other churches. Like and and literally, I mean when I first said we were going to do that, people were like, what? Like, don't know. We're going to lose. I said, this is God's church, guys. Like, what are you talking about? This is not our church. And so it, we never get to connect on Sundays because everybody's in their silos. And 
And a lot of times it's black church, white church, Hispanic church. It's like, it's like the Maranatha church. It's the, it's the Pentecostal church. Like we're all in these different things. And I said, Hey church, um, we're going to call this capital C, um, Sunday. We're, we're going to go to other churches in our community. Maybe your friends or your coworkers have been inviting you to church and you didn't feel right about it because you love this church. And we love that you love this church, but we want to take a Sunday and go be the hands and feet. And we want to go encourage other pastors and encourage the volunteers and encourage the people. So I want you to go wear your represent gear, wear your transformation church gear and show up and praise and worship and take gift cards and like go be the body. We've done that for nine years now. Like this is not a drill or a marketing campaign. Like, and that's why for me, um, I think God was able to do some things at our church that he might not have been able to do at other people's church because I'm not attached to the numeric value the same way a lot of people have to be because of obvious reasons. I just really believe this is God's church. I didn't want to be a pastor. He chose me to be a pastor. I said, yes, I'm going to be obedient, but I'm not going to build this thing as a kingdom or a castle unto myself. I want the kingdom of God to be expanded. The only message that Jesus preached was the kingdom. And I just think a lot of us are preaching our kingdom and not his kingdom. Mm. What was the reaction of the other pastors when you started the not oh, they, my cup of tea <laughs> thing? How did that go? They, they flip out. Like yeah. they they don't, it's like, what? what? Like you're inviting people, you're, you're promoting our church. But um, if we really are the body of Christ, the Bible talks mm -hmm. about all joints being supplied. All of us are different, but we're doing our work so that the entire body can work well together. And um, for me, like, I want to do my part and I want all of those churches to do their part. So more than anything, they feel encouraged and they're like, wow, like I can't believe. And then there's connections that our people make that in enhance their businesses. There's connections that people make that enhance their relationships. Mm -hmm. There's like, I mean, it's about living this life well, not just acting like we're living this life well. And so the more believers that get together and we meet around tables and we connect with each other, I mean, we're, we've been able to help other people's worship by people who were a part of our worship team that were able to get in connection and then the season change and that person needed a worship leader and it was like, well, we know them and da-da-da-da and the season worked right. Like I tell people all the time, I hold people like this. Like if you ever grip them, if you ever do this, mm. there's going to be a lot more pain associated with it if God ever tells them to move or God ever tells you to release them. So you have to hold them like this and you enjoy them and take care of them and steward over them while they're with you. And you pray. I pray that people with us for life, but we know that's not the reality of, of what we do and what we're doing. I just think that um, mitigating some of the pain and the church hurt comes by allowing God to allow you to steward over people for seasons and then release them and bless them when it's time for them to transition. And I know it's not popular. I know we don't talk about it. I know most pastors are bitter around this, but I've it's protected my soul, Carrie, mm -hmm. to, to actually believe that like God's in charge of this church. Like mm -hmm. I get to lead it, but he's the one actually leading it. I'm just the face here on earth leading it. You know what I'm saying? And just trying to always remember that. I'm not perfect at it, but mm -hmm. there are people that have left that as like, ah, oh, that hurt, that sucked. You know what I'm saying? But at the at the end of the day, I know we're building God's kingdom. What did you learn? And I know we could do a whole masterclass on that. What did you learn about discipling people online when you were at it for over two years, because that's a whole reprogramming, dude. You already had yes. like a viral yeah. social media presence and a fledgling online church, but 2020 exploded it. So, yeah, it's great. and you said it's legit church. People's lives are being changed. They're meeting. Uh, and I'm really encouraged to see so many churches have continued with the online yes. and in-person option. Yes. It's like, don't shut it down to get more people in the building. So what are you learning yeah. about digital discipleship? It's real. Like if I can tell anybody anything, I mean, we get stories every week, every day of people who were in hopeless situations and by watching the content, going back to the scriptures, helping people have examples of what it looks like for real people to move through hard situations, their lives have been completely transformed. We have been a beacon of light to point them to the source of all light. And when you hear people that 
are coming out of the jail system and actually giving their life to Christ and they're back with their families and they've not been on the substance and that that put them in jail like for two years and you hear about families getting baptized together who were in other religions and denounced Christianity and you hear about people who were in alternate sexual lifestyles and God healing them of the hurt and the wounds they were in and them subsequently turning their life around and serving God in ministry. Like there, it's real. Mm. Like, and this is the thing, Carrie, that I tell people, it's so real that you have to be okay with not being credited for what God's doing. Yeah. And I think that's the part we really have to wrestle with as leaders, pastors, ministers. Like, can we be a silent partner with God in the transformation that's happening? What if God's doing transformation you can't count? Like, what if God's doing transformation that you can't quantify on a spreadsheet? And I think that, yeah, we want to steward over every number because every number has a name and all of the different things that we've tried to do. But what if God's doing something so revolutionary and revival-based because of the time and age we live in in technology that we may never be accounted on this side of heaven for the part we played in planting or watering the seed? Because we know what the scripture says, some plant, some water, but it's God who adds the increase. And a lot of times we've been able to take credit for the increase because now they got saved and they're on our serve team or now they got saved and they're a big giver or whatever. Like there are people that our ministry has been able to touch that have never given a dollar to our church. And I'm grateful that their souls have been saved, healed, delivered, transformed, and are walking in a progressive path closer to Jesus. And we will never benefit from it. They'll never fold the table. They'll never hold a sign. They'll never actually come to this church. They'll never give a dollar. But we are, were a part of their transformation story. That's the stuff for me that is not about credit. It's about the kingdom. And so it, it, it's had to, you know, it makes you have to reframe what the win is. Like, what's the goal of this? Like, it makes you have to go back and say like uh we may need to we may need to reevaluate what we celebrate because um if god's not going to allow you to see it actually as a win for you is it enough to just be a part of the team and i'm okay and our team is a part of not getting to hold the championship trophy but just knowing that we helped like be a part of the team we're a bench player in this thing and like if that means we win a championship we win a championship but I'm grateful for um, that perspective that's been shaped over this season. It's real. People's lives are being changed. You don't move from California to Tulsa because somebody's doing something fake. Like, <laughs> you don't move your whole, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so, I don't know. It just, yeah. if I can encourage anybody, like, what you do and how it comes over YouTube and your church app and the podcast, it's real. It's making people pray and make real decisions and bringing people closer to God. And if you don't see it like that, you're underestimating the the season and the time we live in and how strong technology can be used for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You uh you uh must have had a real surprise when you reopened the doors. What oh, man. what it, kind of church showed up? What was left? What had happened? Like tell us yeah. about this last year. So when when the when the church opened back up, it was the rider dies. It was the people was like that were they rode for the brand. It was mm -hmm. like you could have stayed closed another four years, we would have been here. But a lot of the fans and a lot of the people that were just getting ingratiated into our culture, because you got to remember, we weren't even supposed to be 2019. Um, in Crazy Faith, we bought that building. Mm -hmm. We weren't supposed to move in for a year because we were going to do the renovations then. But I felt like God said, don't go back. We did conference there uh, in, in September of 2019. And then literally, we were there for five months. We had our grand opening in February, March, COVID. Mm -hmm. So like literally, I mean, when we started, it was, I mean, the building fits 4,000 people. There was like 7,000 people there. It was <laughs> nuts. Like, and then it was like COVID. And then the online ministry expanded. Then we we closed for three and a half years. We opened back up and it's just the core, like probably 1,500 to 1,700 like 
we down. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But online and all the other stuff is moving and God's doing the thing. And so it gave us a unique opportunity to just build, mm -hmm. like build. And really, I tell people all the time, the grace of God is so good because we had nine years of up and to the right. Like, it's just like, boom, 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 boom. And when you're moving that fast, you can't see everything. Mm -hmm. you, you can't see where culture is drift. You can't understand the minute changes in language. You can't, you can't perceive because it's like on to the next thing, more people. How do we do it? Like, you know what I'm saying? And so this last season has given us a time to evaluate and make sure that the values of our ministry are what we want to go into this next decade of ministry with. And it's just been so great. We've done strat ops. We've done strategic um, situations where we come in and I am so excited for where we are as a ministry right now. I've never, I've, I've never been this excited because before I was excited, but we didn't have no resources. We didn't have no connections. <laughs> we were just like, we we're like, okay, let's figure it out. And I was excited, but I'm excited now because nine years in, I feel like I have a lot of um, wisdom, like tried uh, and true understanding under my belt. We have, uh, uh, by God's grace, a little bit of resource and now a team to be able to make these things happen. And so, I don't know, the if what God did in the first nine years of me being a pastor was any indication of what he's about to do, man, I'm just grateful to be a part of this story. That's it. Mm, it's a good attitude to have. But, you know, it's interesting that with all the momentum you had online, you basically went through the same thing everybody else did when they reopened. Definitely. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the key factors is we went through the same thing everybody else did from the perspective of uh, uh, people in attendance. Yes. But we did not do it with the resources and the giving and the partnership. And that's where I would just, and that's another pod for a different day, mm -hmm. but some of the decisions that we were able to make strategically, we did not have to go into panic mode or do anything because of how we actually did cultivate the audience of people that don't even live here. And so where most of the times butts and seats equal uh, revenue, um, gifts, generosity, it didn't do that for us in the same way. And so God was able to do some things to give us some different opportunities. And so that's why I think that everything is for a season in the right season. And if you like listen and obey, it changes the trajectory of what you have to do in a potential valley season. So your new book, Damaged But Not Destroyed, fantastic yes, book. Yes, sir. Fantastic Thank book. you, man. You're so transparent in it. In a way, I, we were saying before we hit record, you're like, yeah, I try to be as transparent as most people are once they're 65, right? And I think that's true, That was Mike. the goal. It's true. What are, you become a celebrity pastor, very well known, not only in America, but around the world. What are some of the hidden underpinnings or challenges associated with being well-known and having a big platform? So so even the title of celebrity pastor comes with a myriad of uh, people's interpretations. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm a celebrity pastor. I feel like I'm a pastor that for some reason God gave impact to. And that's a different way of even thinking about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody else may think that, but what do you think about yourself and what do you know about yourself? I'm just a very, very um, broken man who has been seen by the grace of God and uses all of his gifts to lift him up. And so because of that, um, when I do things and how I do things and what God's given me to do, um, it comes off sometimes um, differently perceived than what the intentions were. And one thing that I've learned in this season is there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> and there, that goes back to the control part of it. Like, I wish I could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every person. I wish that I could help people understand the intent and the motives and the, 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 the actual uh, idea behind what, what God's called me to do. The, but the truth of the matter is everybody doesn't want to know that. Mm -hmm. Some people do mm -hmm. want to see um, people torn down and I've become okay with um, living in the tension of being celebrated for getting the gospel to places that most people would never get it to, as well as being criticized by the very people that are supposed to be my brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is one of those really um, interesting uh, paradigms as I look at Jesus's life, because the same people who were crying Hosanna one day 
we're saying crucify him the next. Mm. And it, it's one of those things as like, oh, I know what you felt, Jesus. Like not in the full way, mm -hmm. but like, <laughs> like, oh, this is what it means to take up your cross. This is what it means like to do those things. And I told somebody the other day, like over the past two years, I, I figured out that I'm a real Christian. I'm a real follower of Christ. Like everybody can say that until fire turns up. Mm -hmm. Everybody can say that until people that you love start talking about you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and by responses, the way I've prayed for people who've just done me wrong, like literally gone through and asked God to bless them. Like that is some hard, that's harder than lifting weights. That mm. is harder than like that level of trying to just make sure my heart was humbled enough to hear um, what people were saying in love and and be able to evaluate, like, is this getting in the way of the message and counseling and mentors and like all of the work that I've had to do to just keep my heart and my mind pure. I, I, I really know I believe in the principles of Jesus Christ and I'm walking with him and he's walking with me and I have a great community around me. It's just been beautiful what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned around from good. I'm more dangerous now than I've ever been because I'm sober. I understand. I didn't know what my platform was, Carrie. Like, I, mm. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're in here doing what God called you to do, but you don't really know. I mean, you see thousands of people on a number or some hearts, or but you don't know what that means sometimes until means that people are against you. They and then you. you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, like, whoa, hold on. I didn't know I mattered that much. I didn't know nothing we did mattered <laughs> that much. You know what I'm saying? And so it's just been, it's been sobering and humbling and good for me to just trust God at a whole nother level. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it, it's been a, uh, a journey of transformation. And I, I, I don't think it's anything weird that the name of our church is Transformation Church <laughs> and that every few years, God takes me through a major transformation. So I'm I'm in it to win it for the long haul. For whatever God wants for me to do, I'm going to go through it because it's just making me more like him. How do you discern which are the criticisms and voices to listen to and which are not? Because I think, honestly, you know, it's not a celebrity pastor question or impact pastor. I mean, yeah. if you're leading 50 people, you're in yes, that sir. arena. If you've got a small business, you're in that arena. You've got fans, yes, you've sir. got critics, you've got people who you thought were going to be with you forever, who stab you in the back as they walk out the door. Yeah. I mean, you got all that stuff. So how do you, because the easy thing to do, Michael, is you're just like, well, I'm not listening to any of that. And then you become in this <laughs> isolated little bubble, right? So how yep. do you determine who to listen to, what to listen to, when to listen, and how? Isolation is the most dangerous place you can be when it comes to being criticized, because that is where the enemy begins to whisper things that you begin to believe. And um, I, I tell people all the time, like when, when criticism comes, you need to get around community. You need to get in your word and be around community because you got to remember who you were, what you said, and what was said about you before any of this was a thing, like before anybody even knew who you were. And so um, isolation is the wrong way to go because when you isolate, we were not meant to live like that. And so what we start doing is numbing the pain or looking for ways to release the pain. And that's where a lot of bad decisions are made. And so what I would encourage people to do is come back the other way. But to your question, it is how do you know the difference is mm. it's hard to know the difference if there is not prior relationship. Mm. And this is what I tell people all the time. Like I can listen to somebody who was invested in my life before it was a problem. It is hard to listen to you when the first thing that you're saying to me is that I'm a problem. And a lot of people do not have the relational equity with people pre an issue, uh, a misunderstanding to be able to come in and lovingly correct. And that's where I don't think that's all the time, but I do think that many times we're lazy on the relationship part. So then when something goes wrong, we don't have that entrance to know, like, you're not just trying to attack me. Like, you're trying to actually advance me. You're trying to help me. You're trying to push me forward. You're trying to show me in love what is supposed to happen. And so gratefully for me, thankfully for me, I had so many people that had uh, so much entrance in my life that I could talk through, that I could counsel with, that I could say, bro, what, what is this? What is that? Or they could say, man, in this area, you should, probably should have, like, 
and be able to do that. I mean, so many people that it was like, oh, I really do have community. Mm. Oh, I really do have mentorship. Oh, I really do have people that care about my, my well-being. Um, the other thing I would say with that is in love. Like, the church is really bad at the in love. Thing. Like, <laughs> yes. we we can speak the truth. We got that part of the scripture. But in love, like the Bible literally says, the way that unbelievers will know that you're mine is by the way you have relationship with each other. Yeah, that is loaded. Because if we look at the way believers devour believers for missteps, mistakes, shortcomings, uh, difference of opinions, all of those things, I wonder what that's showing the world. Because he literally said, that's how they're going to know your mind, is your love for one another. And I just think that um, this last season of my life has just made me more sober to what I do behind the scenes when I see a brother or sister going through anything. And I just want to be one that steps out, loves, covers, helps them, gets them the help they need, sends them in the direction of Jesus and pulls them in instead of pushes them out. I think about the man that uh, um, was on the road and got beat up and the Levite passed him, mm -hmm. the pastor passed him, the worship leader passed him. And it was the Samaritan that came through and, and said, put it on my tab. Like, like just, just handle them. And Jesus is asking, who do you think is more like me. Like, who do you think, like, actually is somebody? And it wasn't the people who had the titles. It was the people who actually, or the position, it was the people who actually were with the people and actually put their skin in the game. And so, um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's one of those really cool things that I believe that God's given me a lot of revelation on because of the last season that I worked, walked through. And I'm looking forward to living that out as well as helping other people live that out in their everyday life. So you go there in your book, but can we talk about the spit incident? I don't know yeah. what else to call it, but... When the spit hits the when fan, the spit that's what hits I call it. So set the story. It made the New York Times, CNN. I mean, it was national, if not international news. Yeah. And I remember it happening. I think I sent you a note at the time. What, what happened? And then let's talk about the fallout. Yeah, yeah. So what ended up happening was me, as long as I've been a pastor, I've been a pastor that does examples because I believe we live in a very, very, very visual world. I mean, my two-year-old sees excellent images every day on her iPad of cartoons and different things. And so we live in a visual wor world. And so I was one of those people in church that I would be bored when somebody's just up there talking. Like, I just mm -hmm. couldn't do it. And I mean, we look at the statistics of most young people and youth in the world today, they, they are not into church at all. Right. Like, even if your youth group is pop, popping, the generation is not popping towards God. And so part of what I like to do is make the Bible come to life. And so we did the example um, of Jesus spitting and, and, and then putting it in a man's eye. And the whole idea was um, that would you be willing to stay in a process that God has you in, even if it's messy, even if it's disgusting, even if it feels like the worst thing you've ever gone through? And I was trying to tell my church, I said, this man was blind, but he wasn't deaf. Like if somebody was hawking up a loogie, like it's something <laughs> like, you know what that is. So that man had to choose to stay there because it was better to go through something messy and potentially get his healing than to stay in the condition he was in. And so um, I did the example. The crazy thing is this was my third time doing this example. This I've done it. I had done it two times prior and at another prominent church. Wow. There was nothing that ever happened because of it. So I called my brother up on the stage. Now, this is my blood brother. This, I mean, we've uh, uh, done everything together. I have four brothers, five Todd boys. I mean, drink after each other, fight, like blood everywhere. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is my real brother. And I think it was a combination of it being COVID season as well as uh, just it being disgusting, which was the point of the example um, that I did it and I put it on his eyes and it's like nasty and all the other stuff. And what ended up happening was that's when I learned that our platform had grown beyond people who were actually invested in life transformation. Mm -hmm. There were people that were watching and that were devouring the content that were there on the fringes 
to find something to be able to discredit the message. Mm. And before we even got out of church, I mean, TMZ, CNN, all this, how could you do this to another black man? And this, this pastor spit, I mean, the headlines were, were awesome. I mean, people were super creative. Like it was phenomenal. And, um, I mean, I have a Sabbath, so I turn my phone off and all that other stuff on Sunday evenings. And so I was just thinking, I mean, the message went great to me. It felt like it was impactful. People gave their life to Jesus, like all this other stuff. But I didn't know there was this whole thing brewing under. And then my chief of staff called and she was like, is Mike okay? Uh, and Natalie's like, yeah, he's just sleeping right here. And and I was like, why? And he's like, he's on TMZ and da 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 da. And I was like, oh, wow. I, anytime we've ever went viral before, <laughs> it was good. Like, it was like, wow, maybe the gospel is going to brand new places. Like, that's how I felt. And um, it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were tearing us down and throwing us under the bus. And the crazy thing about it is the most vitriol came from people who were believers, mm -hmm. like pastors and and people who wanted me to come to their conferences and wanted me to build stuff with them. And it, it was just, it was nuts. And so thank God for all of the counseling and the therapy and the different things I had done prior to this. Um, that next day, we left, turned off my phone, and I went to protect my soul. Like, I knew that if I took in everything that was happening, it had the opportunity to make me bitter and to make me hate the people that I'm supposed to love. And um, so we went to Napa with two of our friends mm -hmm. and we sat in a hotel and for four days we prayed, we talked, we processed, we worshiped, we ate burgers, we ate milkshakes, we, uh, we walked, we swam, we went to the beach. Like, like I, just, I just tried to get with God and remember what he called me to do. And coming up on that Saturday, I, I had an option. Like I talked to my oversight pastor. I talked to all the people, the board and everything like that. And they're like, you don't have to come back and preach. I was like, yes, I do. I was like, this is not me trying to white knuckle my way through it. I said, but this generation has to see what it looks like for somebody to not abandon their post when adversity hits. Mm. And by the time that next Sunday came, because of the work that I did, the processing that I did, the crying that I did, the confessing that I did, like the evaluation that I did, I didn't have any venom in my heart. I told God I would never get in that platform with venom because then it infects people instead of affects them. And that next Sunday, I was able to preach a message called Here is Holy. <laughs> and it was literally the theme of the year that God had given me six months before. I didn't know I would be preaching it when the whole world thinks I'm a false prophet and this, that, and it's just for show and da, 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 all the different things that they said. And God told me six months before, he said, here is holy. Right here, I'm going to make you. Right here, I'm with you. Right here, I'm going to speak to you. And uh, Carrie, I can't tell you how cleansing that season was for me of everything that I thought I wanted that God didn't want me to have. Hmm. Like I had no need and no desire to be known more. Before that, there was something in me, if we're honest, mm -hmm. that was like, man, I can't wait till this platform grows even bigger and da, da 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 I became so content. And to this day, I'm content. Again, part of the reason why we were still shut down at that time, part of the reason why is like when we came back and whoever was there, I was just grateful. Like I don't, I, I don't I don't need anything. Like God has already exceeded every expectation I ever had as a pastor, leader, business person, author. But like he has done more for me partnering with him. And I just, I, I needed that cleansing. Hmm. I needed to not need anybody's opinion um, or approval except God's. I needed to not be invited to anybody's conference. I needed that. It has made me into the man of God who I am that is grateful for every moment that God gives me to be able to speak to anybody. What I used to take for granted now is something that I get so much joy out of. Like, And I'm grateful for what God used that for in me. And I pray that when history is written about it one day, that, that it will be told that this is what happens 
when you go through a fire and a trial, but God is with you and you continue to love and continue to serve and continue to give. And um, yeah, I just, I think it was one of the most beautiful things that hurt a whole bunch mm. that I've ever been through. But it is, again, made me into a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Moved you closer, not further away. Oh, what are you talking about? It could have moved me further away. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it could have easily made me be like, forget church. Like, I can go, I, I, if it's, I can go do something else. Like, you know what I'm saying? But like, <laughs> I have options. Yeah. It, I got options, but it truly solidified my calling. Yeah. It, it made me more resolute. It made me more um, intentional on making sure that I did the things that I needed to do on and off a platform to be able to be the man of God that I'm supposed to be to my wife, to my family, to my staff, to my team, to this church. And anything God does out, outside of that, it's just cherry on top. Like, I'm, I'm good. And um, that's part of the reason why I used it in Damaged But Not Destroyed. And the crazy thing about this book that I'm releasing is God gave me the message of Damaged But Not Destroyed almost a year before anything had happened. So I finished the book. Next week is when the spit hit the fan. <laughs> so, so like, it was like God was giving me like, hey, I'm about to take you through something and, and it's going to be a public display of how you can be damaged but not destroyed. They're going to think your, your, uh, your name is what you want to protect, but you don't have to defend that because I'll defend that if you just keep walking out this process. So we had to go and add those chapters into it and when the spit hits the fan and all that. But for me, I want to use everything, man. I want my life to be used to be able to see God's glory. And that means that sometimes you got to tell stuff real time. You know what I'm saying? And how God's using it. What did you learn about critics? So I've had a couple things go viral, like at one one hundredth of the scale that you've had things go viral. But it was interesting, Mike, because when I was talking to my team about something, I posted just a reel and all of a sudden, you know, you check and it's like, whoa, this is, whoa, there it goes again. There it goes again. Yep. My audience understood what I was saying, but of course the algorithm, exactly as you said, promotes it way beyond your audience if it starts to take off. Yes, and, sir. and then almost nobody understood what I was saying. And I, th I read every comment. I thought, okay, I'm going to post something explaining what I meant. Then I slept on it, prayed about it. And I thought, there's no point. There's no point. Not at all. What, what, about, what about you? What did you learn about yeah. that? Um, we could do a whole pod on just that. Like, yeah. I, like, because I think it hasn't been modeled properly, especially in this digital age. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that, um, yeah, you either get one or two extremes. You get the person that's 46 people down in the comments cussing at people, like, and calling them everything mm -hmm. out of the book. Or you get the people who act like it doesn't exist and it doesn't affect anything. And I think that there's somewhere in the middle that we need to land as people that God has given leadership to, stewardship responsibility, and people who have people that are following them. And so um, for me, um, especially when it's negative criticism, I think the first thing that you have to do if you want to last is you have to protect your mind, will, and your emotions. You have to protect your soul. And so one of the things that um, I had to do was stop hearing it. I, I, I had to cut it off. I couldn't read the comments because I'm a fighter. Like I will, I get, I, I am convincing. Like I can, I can go toe to toe with you. And then like the truth of the matter is for what? Like to, to, to do what, what is that going to do? And so I learned in this season to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Hmm. And, um, it is, it is really cool to watch myself transform because my idea of what needed to happen was that I'm going to actually, I'm going to take control of this narrative and I'm going to do this and I'm going to refute. And God was like, um, no, I'm going to give you time to process. And I want you to respond instead of react. Mm -hmm. See, most people in these situations, like we got to get in front of this and we're going to react and like, mm -mm, I'm going to respond. And what it forced me to do, and some of these things um, will be seen soon, is instead of um, reading comments, I decided to create. And so I took all the energy that I would use to be able to do something that would have no value 
I channeled all of that to make things that would be of value. So the music that I've made, the books that I've made that nobody's even heard of yet, the stuff that is going to be um, um, a value add and really bring people closer to Jesus that I created over the past year, can't nobody take that away from me. The, and, 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 and it's going and, and to bless people, bless my family, and bless God. And so I would, one thing that I learned is when criticism comes, create, don't comment. Mm. Like use it mm. as fuel to do the opposite. They're saying this, 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 make something that's this, 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 this. They're saying you're taking people away from the kingdom, make something that's bringing people to the kingdom. And, and, and when I tell you, as I began to create and I got in the studio, my first love is music, the songs that came. The, th the thoughts, the different things that have come and carry, I've never been so creatively alive in my entire life, mm. but it's where I redirected my energy. And a lot of people try to manage, again, the, 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 the mass media, and that's nothing nobody can do. If CNN and Fox can't figure out how to do it, if the president can't figure out how to do it, how in the world is a, a pastor gonna figure out how to do it? What you can control, though, is your own self mm. and your soul. And man, this last season for me has been so refreshing. Like it, I can't even like, I don't know if you could tell, like I'm younger now. Like you I'm know, older I, I was in age. Say, like when we were talking about the physical thing, I'm like, dude, you're glowing. And I've mm. done 600 of these interviews. That's not the camera. It's not the mic. Like, and I, and I appreciate that because it's real. It's yeah. authentic. Like I'm younger today. I am more youthful in my spirit because of this season that I've gone through. And and that's why when the scripture says, lay aside every weight, especially the sin that easily besets you, I feel like this is a season of pruning for me. It was a season of laying aside weights, um, cares for certain things, comments, deals, all the different things, like opportunities. Like I laid aside all of those weight. I didn't have sin in my life, but it literally says there's two categories, lay aside all of the weights especially the sin. So there's mm -hmm. weights that aren't sin. There are weights that are not um, something that um, separate your connection to God, but that they they slow you down from purpose. And those are the things that I believe this last season has taught me. And I, I get goosebumps talking about it because as, as hard as it was to go through the season, I wouldn't take it back. Like as frustrating as it was to be misunderstood and and to have people chop up stuff with no context. I mean, literally, like, it, 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 it's lazy at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It was like, mm -hmm. and then just people believing it. Like, it's like, yeah, that's what they did. Like, it's like, what is going on? But like, it, it didn't matter because what it made me into is it took all of my damage, all the areas I needed to really give to God. And it made me present them to him and he transformed me. And that's why, even in this new book, like the whole thing is, yeah, you may be damaged, but you're not destroyed. God can take you from trauma to triumph and the value is still in you. Well, and you know, um, I mean, you're pretty honest in the book. You're like, yeah, I would not do that again. That probably oh. wasn't a smart move. I mean, you apologize for it. And thank goodness, you know, it was your brother and it didn't have any, it was just a thing. But you know, the other thing you forget is that the news cycle has a life cycle. Right. And yeah. four days later, they're on to a new subject, but it just feels like your world is falling apart. And it's funny, I, I, you know, in my little micro viral thing where the algorithm just pumped it out to a couple hundred thousand people, you know, and you get all these negative comments, people who hate the church, who hate pastors, et cetera. And I, I, I read them all. I tried to learn what I could from them. I engaged with people I thought were well motivated, fairly well. Um, but I really got a sense the next day after I prayed about it and thought, no, I'm not going to rebut anything. It's like picked up a few thousand new followers. It's like, now you can show them a more positive route. I mean, you were misunderstood. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, and I probably wouldn't do that same reel again, but you know, very little damage done. Now you can lead people in a positive direction and away you go. Mike, you know, the challenge with talking to you is we need to go Rogan. We just need to book an afternoon and let the, let the tape roll, buddy. We just buddy. need to be there for six hours. Uh, six you hours know with Mike Todd. I mean, do you know how little I've covered I'm so just far? So <laughs> we haven't even scratched the surface I of know, We buddy. probably are, Gary, going to have to do a second, a, uh -huh. a second a situation two. so we can actually talk about the book. I know you've got time, but... <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to say, no, you're we'll so transparent. You're transparent about marriage, 
about porn, yes. about all kinds of challenges yes. in your life. And and yes. I think you're right. Most people wait until it's 20 years in the past and then they write about it. So I'm just so grateful Carrie, for it, you. I think it's I think it's counterproductive though because the Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb. That's what he did. And the words of our testimony. This is how I stay free. This is how I overcome. This is how, like, many people fall back into their same cycles because they won't talk about it. He literally tells us the words of your testimony, like the words of the thing that you got over last week, the words of the thing that almost took your business out, but you did it in integrity. That thing is going to cause you to overcome. And so a lot of people can't figure it out. Like, why are you faithful after you talk about all of this porn addiction? Or why are you still successful after you did things that were manipulative with money before you were a pastor? Like, why? It's because I am not keeping those testimonies from other people. Like, I am, I'm not riddled with shame. I am not riddled with guilt because God has freed me from that through what he's done. And then if he's done that part, my part is the testimony part. And so I'm just encouraging people right now, man, like part of your power to walk free and stay free is in the words of your testimony. That's what God has given all of us. And I don't mean to preach, but I am a pastor. <laughs> and I just want... I want everybody to know that you may be damaged and that damage is real and you're going to have to deal with it. Like, and you're going to have to walk through it and you need counseling and you need community. But, but I tell people all the time, like it may not have been your fault what happened to you, but it is now your responsibility. And there's too many of us that have not taken responsibility for where we are today and what we can do to move forward. And so for me, man, sharing hot is what I call it. Humble, open, and transparent. It's, it is the way that I stay free and the way that I believe all people that follow Jesus will stay free. I just think a lot of, a lot of people need the courage to actually do it. Well, and it breaks down the veneer and that's what I love yes, about sir. it. Right. And you're right. It's, it's, and the other thing I'll say in closing is, and you feel free to disagree, but I think women are naturally better at this in ministry than oh, men. Oh, definitely. Like, oh, I've talked to Ann Voskamp and Jenny Allen about it. I mean, Jenny opens her book on community going, I stink on community. And Ann Voskamp and I were talking once and she goes, why do women need to lead with their weaknesses while men lead with their strengths? And I'm like, mm. but you know what? Craig Rochelle has done this. He's so open, so transparent, so vulnerable. You're doing it. We need more leaders we need to more. be able to say where we are at right now. And yep. that takes away, then what are people gonna, gonna do? And of course you're human, Mike. Yes. Of course I'm human. Like, my goodness. Yes. You know, like, so thank you. Thank you for leading the way. Thanks for being a pioneer in this. You know how much I appreciate you. Man, I love you. And I got to tell you this story before we get out of here. Yeah. I saw you in Colorado Springs walking out of Target like four months ago. And you didn't and stop me? I, I yelled your name, but you were you were like laser focused. Oh, yeah. And then that was, I would have had to that run That was to you. me. Are you kidding me? You were there too? You were in Target and I was in Colorado Springs. And I think it was Colorado Springs. It's somewhere yeah. in Colorado. We were in Colorado. And I literally yeah. walked into tar Target. And you was walking out. I said, is that Carrie Newell? And I was like, that is Carrie. And I said, like, Carrie, and you, you was gone. You, was your gone. wife had sent you in on a, on a mission. And I, I said, I'm going to tell him. But next time, maybe maybe I'll just come in studio with you. We'll sit in yeah, there. Just or do we that. can do another one, another mm -hmm. one of these. Like, or slap I me on the back. I love talking to you. I love yeah, talking man, to you. I love you so much. You helped a lot of leaders. Love you, man. Thank you so much. The book, Damaged But Not Destroyed, All Things Mike Todd can be found at, where, where are you showing up online? Instagram? Everywhere. Yeah. Target, Instagram, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon. Just type in Damaged But Not Destroyed from Trauma to Triumph, and you can um, take this journey. I promise you, God cannot heal what you won't reveal. But once you get down to the dirty part of your damage, it will take you to your destiny.